Johan Verbeke is Belgium's ambassador to the United States. He joins us to discuss the aftermath of the attacks on Brussels and its implications for Europe. Mr. Ambassador, thank you very much for joining us. Good morning. Let me ask you first. Uh, first, I want to offer condolences on the loss of life thank and the you trauma your country has gone through. Uh, how are people doing? Is there any sense of returning to normalcy? Well, absolutely. I would say the return to normalcy was almost happening the day after the attacks. And it's quite interesting to see. I think it's, it's part of the resilience of the Belgian people, but also there was a kind of reaction. We are not going to be intimidated by what happened. And as you know, people went back to work the day after the attacks. The schools were open, children were going to school. And that is very important, I think, in terms of reaction to such a dramatic event. That is that you should not give in, you should not let go, you should stand on your feet and continue just ahead. The opposite of what education. the terrorists want. Exactly. By, because should we have dramatized the situation, should we have gotten into a kind of atmosphere of panic, that is exactly what a terrorist would be. So tell us, you've, I'm sure you've processed a lot of the criticism of intelligence and law enforcement. And yeah. what, what is your reaction to that? Do you think it's accurate or is it unfair? Well, we think we, think we, ha we need to have a discussion based on the merits. And slogans and stereotypes don't really help much, I think, mm -hmm. in that kind of a debate. So we have to look at the facts and figures as they stand. Is everything perfect as far as security and intelligence is concerned? It is certainly not. But I can tell you that as of the end of 2012, that is the very beginning of, you know, the outflow of foreign fighters and so, because we had the Syria crisis in the summer of 2012, our people were already working on the file. And a lot of it had happened. Just, for, just to give you one indication, we had over 150 court trials. Mm -hmm. Out of them, 85 terrorists have been convicted not just arrested and whatever, but actually convicted. We had the Verviers attempt, as you remember, an attempt for an attack, a major attack against what probably was going to be a, a police station. That was in early 15, January 15, and that network had been dismantled. So there were things going into the right direction. But then again, nobody is immune, we think, for such kind of attacks. These are attacks that are, in this case, were again Belgium, but basically it's Europe and the world at large that potentially can be a victim of such attacks. And, and speaking of things that we're not immune from, is this balancing act between security and, and civil liberties. Yeah. How do you, have you how much thought have you given that and, and well, is a lot. It, I'm, I'm sure. And, uh, <laughs> no. and so so with the pressure on to address what is perceived to be a growing problem, what's your approach? Well, as you said, it's a question of balance. It's a question of finding the balance between what you could call security and rule of law, privacy, fundamental rights. And the whole exercises, where do I put exactly that kind of mm -hmm. tipping point between the two? Where, respectful of the rule of law, I'm still efficient and effective as far as security is concerned. And you find that back in the organizations that have to handle this terrorist threat. Because from the security side, of course, they don't have too much qualms about right. the niceties of the law. No, they want the tools and to do their conversely, job. the lawyer sometimes would like to overstress the legal principles. Mm -hmm. And we have to make sure that there is kind of a bridge between these two communities, as far as including information sharing is concerned, so that we get the maximum out of it. That's it's a win-win. And speaking of information sharing, looking at the broader picture of the European continent and even beyond, yeah. what, the level of cooperation that's necessary to address yeah. this threat. What, what are your thoughts on, on the current status of the EU, on intelligence sharing, on law enforcement well, it's, coordination? It's improving day by day, but let me also say there is still a way to be gone. As you know, matters regarding to defense and security are very close to the principle of what they call the sovereignty of a state. Mm -hmm. And people, nations, states are very protective of that kind of areas. We have to understand that when you are faced with an international threat, the response has to be an international, transnational, transborder thing. Now, on this point, I can self-confidently tell you that if there is one country that is open, demanding, asking, full cooperation 
with foreign countries, it's Belgium. And I stress the point, I, I, I'm happy that I can stress the point that, for instance, the cooperation with your authorities here in the United States is working very well. And I'm authorized to state that publicly because I had two meetings last week with your Home Security uh, Secretary at whom I asked, can I say that publicly? I said, go ahead, <laughs> no, no problem. We have security clearance. Yeah. That the, uh, uh, are there specific proposals that Belgium has in mind for the European Union, or, or is the momentum just what you described, that incrementally it's getting better? No, we, we are, as I said, we are a demanding party for a lot. Uh, we have to see how fast the European machinery can work. Uh, clearly, there is momentum now. Everybody is aware that although it happened primarily in Paris and now in Belgium, everybody knows that it could as well happen in Germany. You know that there is sure. some nervousness growing in Germany. There were arrests in Italy and so on, in, in Holland just recently. So we are all in for it. So the momentum is there. I think increasingly we will be working. But let me stress again at one point. We, for instance, you know the famous PNR, Passenger Name Record, that has been blocked at the level of the European Parliament. We've always said, please, Parliament, lift your objections. We need that instrument. Now, we, as far as Belgium is concerned, our whole PNR system is already in place. So we just wait for Europe to let us plug in into the system, and there it goes. A, a final thought on, on the stresses that this is putting on the continent and on the European Union, starting with migration, with terrorist attacks, now with the Brexit threatening to, yeah. to weaken the Union further. Can, it, can the European Union withstand these pressures? Yeah, I, I, I'm confident. You know, it's not the end of the European Union, as some say. Uh, the European Union has a lot of kind of resilience coming out of a crisis, sometimes even reinforced. The point I would like to make is, as, as you mentioned, migration, terrorism, these are essentially external burdens that have come on us and which would have been difficult to handle even at the level of a state. Even a state would have had difficulties let alone the European Union, which is a kind of international organization bringing states together to face uh, those, those challenges. So I, I think we will survive for sure. Ambassador Verbeke, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, uh, wishing you the best because clearly we're all in this together. Thank you so thank much. You, thank you. Bye-bye.